Systems do in the name of God. In Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah Ahmad. Brothers and sisters and friends, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those who do not know what that means, that actually means may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Today's topic is faith and reason, friends or foes. Very interesting discussion. This actually has been a discussion for many, many, many years, particularly in the European continent where I'm from. This discussion has created wars. For instance, when we had an interpretation of the Catholic Church in Europe, it used to use the coercive arm of the state to prevent any ideas or any philosophies or any concepts that were not in line with church doctrine. As a result, that facilitated an emotional and intellectual environment where you had the like of Martin Luther, who pegged on a church door in Wittenberg, his thesis attacking the Catholic tradition. And some would argue from a historical perspective that that facilitated another environment where you had the 80-year wars in Europe. You had the 30-year wars. You had the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. Blood was chin high in the name of religion. And this again facilitated another environment. Because there are a lot of thinkers who were saying, we can't have this anymore. We can't be killing each other just because of ideas. Which ideas, from a human perspective, are things that are inherent within the human being. They're innate. Human beings were born to think. So we can't be fighting because of ideas, because of concepts, because of beliefs. This doesn't make any sense. So what happened, you had the likes of Locke, Hume, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Puffendorf, and many, many others that basically started to look at humanity as abstract entities, which basically means they viewed the human being as an individual that had no social attachments and obligations intrinsically. That would mean they could surpass God's vision for society. So this topic about reason and faith is very important because if you see it specifically from the Christian tradition, the Christian tradition reacted to the Enlightenment era, to the post-Enlightenment era in various ways. One of the ways that the Christian tradition did that is by rejecting rationality altogether. It's saying, you know what? Rationality is a way of forming conclusions but it's not the only way to form conclusions. We have another way. And that way is almost like an intuition or faith. So you hear some of the Christian philosophers argue, I want you to prove to me why rationality is the only way to form conclusions. So they'll try and find a case to go against rationality and reason. Now, the reason we have to understand this from a historical context, because it's formed, generally, Western civilization, this debate. It's been a milestone in forming Western civilization. And the reason I spoke to you about European history is because we have to understand that we can't use it anymore to view other traditions. This is very important because we fall, us living in the West, brought up in the West, educated in the West, we fall for a logical fallacy. And that logical fallacy is that because religion was bad in Europe, because religion was trying to stop things from progressing in Europe specifically, therefore all religions are the same. And that is the logical fallacy. And this is why sometimes you would read in various popular culture literature works from Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great, works from Richard Dawkins, The Good Delusion, and other popular culture literature from intellectuals with a small eye. Yeah. They would basically say things like, you know, look, religion is really bad for you. 
religion cause wars and it's terrible. But that's a particular European construct because we try and apply a specific historical issue, problem, reality and try to superimpose it on the rest of religious tradition. This is why Islam, which is the tradition of the Muslims, doesn't really have the same type of history. I would even argue it doesn't even have the same type of intellectual and historical baggage. Because if we do quickly skim the surface with regards to Islamic history, we would see that there was almost a symbiotic relationship. There was a positive relationship between those in power, the ruling class, if you like, or the elite, and those who wanted to progress with regards to ideas and the natural sciences. This is why the cultural product of the Muslim world was the likes of Ibn Sina, who developed a book called The Canon of Medicine, which was used in Europe for 600 years. This is like one of the cultural products of the Islamic world in history. This is why Maria Rosa Menocal, she's a historian specializing in Islamic history, she says, we owe the Muslims and Islam a great deal with regards to Western civilization. Because it's a well-known historical reality that Islam and the Muslims preserved the Greek philosophical texts. They took some of the concepts and ideas and developed them further with regards to the natural sciences, etc., etc. So it's important to understand this historical reality so we don't view other traditions in a skewed way because we're bringing with us some type of intellectual baggage, if you like. You know, the Chinese, what do they say? They say, empty your teacup. If you want to drink British tea, or you have Chinese tea, you need to drink it or throw it away, and it's ready to experience the beautiful taste of British tea, right? And the only way to do that is if you empty your teacup. Similarly with the mind, empty your mind as much as you can. Remove the historical, intellectual, even sociological baggage that we carry so we could really allow a tradition to speak for itself. And that is very profound and important. That's why I suggest that everyone in this room actually does something very special. And that is to turn off the radio. Can you turn off your radio, please? What do I mean by that? I mean, you know when someone speaks, we always have this little voice that judges all the time, makes judgments all the time. We do it, I do it, everyone does it. It's our radio. For example, oh, he thinks he's clever. He's got a British accent. Oh my god, he looks daisy. I don't believe he's green. Yeah? All these things. He even thinks he's funny. Yeah? We have that internal radio, and you've been doing it when I was talking to you now. So, what we should try and do is just really turn that radio off. Do you know why? Because it would allow us to connect with each other as human beings in ways that we've never done before. And it's important to do that because it means I don't judge you, you don't judge me, and you're trying to listen as much as possible to what I'm saying. And even if it's wrong, understand why it's wrong. Don't, don't judge it based upon ignorance, judge it based upon what you've heard. And it would be very profound because it would allow us to see each other as a blank canvas so we could paint our own realities and we could view each other in that way and therefore understand what makes us distinct. Because it's from our distinctions as human beings, as entities, that enable us to connect with each other as human beings. Because if I connect with you because I think you're just a human being, and I assume you have the same emotions, values and, that I have, then that's a problem. Because I'm not really connecting with you. I'm connecting with an image I have developed of you. That's a difference. I really want to connect with the real person. And the way to do that is to understand what makes us distinct with regards to values and ideas sometimes. Sometimes it will be the same. Sometimes they will be different. Good. Is that alright guys? Good. So, reason and faith. Obviously speaking as a Muslim, a lot of my discussion will be talking about why I believe that Islam is in line with reason. But also a good major part of the discussion will be in line with many other faiths like the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, etc. etc. So we're going to have a very nice discussion. Particularly I want more of a discussion than the question answers. 
because that's when we flesh out the ideas. Because I'm going to generally skip through some key concepts. You may not understand some, you may understand some, you may know some better than I do. If that's the case, let's have a conversation. We're all here to, we're all here to learn. And that's what I want for today. Wow, they must not like water. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, so reason. Now, first and foremost, what do we mean by reason? This is something very important. I'm going to give you a crude example and a more philosophical one. Let's start with the crude one because it's very easy. Yeah? What we mean by reason, if, say you're all sitting in your condo, yeah? You're rich enough to own one. And at 12 o'clock midnight, you hear a knocking on the door. Who is it? You're in your pajamas, man. Yeah, you're comfortable, you got your slippers, you got your hot chocolate, you look through the spyglass and you see, you see a man with pink underwear. Just with pink underwear. Alright, and he says, hello, I want to check your gas meter. I'm from the gas company. I'm from the gas board. And you're thinking, looking through the spyglass, what on earth is this? This guy must be crazy. So what would you do? The rational human being would we'll call the gas company at least and say, have you changed your uniform policy? <laughs> yeah? Do you have night shift? And then obviously you will not allow him in because you're going to use your previous experience, your previous knowledge, the reality at hand, previous concepts, in order to form a conclusion. So this is a crude way of understanding what reason actually means. Now from a philosophical perspective, it's a little bit more deeper, okay? Now, in Western philosophy, we generally had two schools. There was a middle path, which is a Kantian thesis, which we'll discuss. But let's talk about the first two type of... Is this a permanent marker? No. It is. No, it's not. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. We had the rationalists, okay? And we had the empiricists. Now, what we mean by reason today sometimes, especially on a popular culture, culture level, is that people who are rational are empiricists. Because we always hear sometimes, where's your scientific evidence? You're not reasonable, you're not rational, because you don't have scientific evidence. But in reality, it's not traditionally viewed as a rationalist position. It's an empirical, empiricist position. Now let me describe these two concepts. Now the rationalists, they had a thesis that basically you could gain knowledge independent of experience. Think about this. You can gain some knowledge independent of the physical world. And they called this, who knows? A priori, okay? And the empiricists, they said, no, the only knowledge you can gain is from experience. Touch and feel. That's the only reality. And they called this a post. I forgot how to spell it. You know how to spell it? E R C. That's one. There you go. Yeah? Which you can only gain knowledge from experience itself. Now they both had they had many arguments. Now, the argument for the rationalists, and this is a Kantian argument to show that there are some ideas that we have that are innate. It's the innate concept thesis, for example. And they said, he said specifically that no, there is an aspect of rationality that we have. Meaning, we can gain knowledge from innate experience, rather innate ideas and concepts, independent from experience. And he decided to use causality as an example. Causality. And this was a Kantian argument. And he said, look, how do we order our perceptions? Now, let me give you an example. Say I'm staring at the three people who have been talking during my presentation thus far, yeah? <laughs> Say I'm staring at them, yeah? Now, I could see the gentleman first with the interesting checkered jumper. I could then look at the interesting lady with the hair behind her ears. 
and then the other lady with her head in front of her ear, right? Now, my choice of perception started with the gentleman, the lady, and the other lady, right? I chose to perceive that reality in my way. I ordered my perception. Now, if the lady with the green top, she came doing front flips down the auditorium, I would have no choice but to see her front first before I see her back. And the only way I've understood when I could order my own perceptions is because of the innate concept of causality. If we didn't have an innate, which means outside of experience, idea, concept of causality, I would never know how to order my experiences. Do you see? So that's why Immanuel Kant, he said, yes, there is a rational thesis. We can't have a priori. Questions at the end, sir. Do apologize. Okay? Uh, Questions at the end. Oh. Sorry. Is that right? Yes. Just for the flow. Yeah, I understand. Okay? Good. Um, unless you're going to leave in five minutes. <laughs> That's good then. Okay. So we do, we can have concepts independent of experience. And this is why we had the other reality of mathematics. Maths. Okay? Because many would argue that maths are necessary. They're logically necessary truths. They're independent of experience. For example, you know, a very crude way of understanding this is saying, prove to me 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 using an empirical methodology. What is 1? So, from the math, the math has always been the big battleground between the rationalist and the empiricist anyway. But generally, here are some conceptual evidence to show that we do have innate concepts and ideas, which supports a rationalist thesis. Now the empiricists, they said, no, you could justify everything in the physical world. But I personally feel that causality and the mathematical realities couldn't be justified with an empirical approach. Couldn't be justified by just using experience. And that's the problem here. Because sometimes when we have discussions on the existence of God, when we have discussions of religious philosophy, you'd always see the claim, but it's not rational. But what they mean, it's not empirical. That's what it means. Because, for example, intellectuals like Richard Dawkins, he presupposes empiricism. He presupposes scientific naturalism to be true and the only way to form conclusions about life. Now, as a result of holding these two different opinions, there was a middle ground, but we could discuss that in the question and answers. But as a result of holding these two types of philosophies, the rationalists, they had claims to truth, okay? They said there is such a thing as truth, right? Generally. But the empiricists, and this is my opinion, we have a further discussion, that they couldn't claim any truth. This is why it led to a philosophical position called skepticism. <coughs> now, the reason, one of the main reasons the rationalists would disagree with this is because they would say there are some foundational truths that exist. For example, how do we keep this building up? It's because the foundations work and the laws that we've used are actually true because they work. So they would say, Skepticism is entirely not an accurate philosophical position because you can have a basic truth and from those truths build and create other truths which they called epistemic foundationalism. Which basically means we take some basic truths and assumptions and principles that we know to be true and we build on them to come to other truths. Whereas the empirical view, the empiricists, generally will go down the line of skepticism, which means that there is no truth. That we can't really claim truth. Now one way of dealing with this, and it's a very crude way of dealing with it, is by basically saying, you know what, how can you claim there is no truth? Because the claim of that there is no truth is the claim of truth. Do you see? So the, they would say the skeptic is, is self-defeating. The best thing that they should do is actually maybe shut up. <laughs> or just 
friend, or, or just like politely suggest that there is no truth. Yeah? <laughs> also, skepticism doesn't really work in the practical terms, even from an empirical perspective, because we see things to be true, working, like the laws of physics, the foundations for this building. How would we ever build bridges if we had a if we presuppose a skeptical tradition? We would never be able to build bridges, man. We're like, oh well, there is no truth, so you know. We might sacrifice all these lives and the bridge won't work. So, that type of skepticism I think was unhealthy. But there is a healthy type of skepticism and we, should, we could discuss that in the Q&A. So, what, so, when I'm talking about reason, I'm talking about combining a priori with a posteriori. That's what I mean. I mean that there is some innate concepts that we have we have an innate concept thesis which we could justify with mathematics and causality, but also we do get knowledge from the external world. And this one in the middle ground is what I mean by reason. But many neo-atheists, for instance, they actually forget this sometimes. And they are hardcore empiricists. And this is quite funny saying that. Stephen Hawking, he wrote a book called The Grand Design, and he wrote in his introduction, philosophy is dead. That's what he said. Because he seems to me, as a result of reading the book, that he has an assumption that the only way we could gain knowledge is from the external world, from experience itself. And we can't have any, we don't have any innate concepts that weave through the empirical world to create an understanding. And if you do read his book, you see at the end, there's a big contradiction. And it's because he's totally rejected the rational thesis. So. Let's do, oh. didn't I tell you? <laughs> didn't I? I'm making in trouble, guys. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Who gave me this? <laughs> Is that <a> joke? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, there's other pens here, that's good. <laughs> um, so, wait, let me just test something out. Because it usually works if you combine it. There you go, see? <laughs> <laughs> God exists, right? <laughs> Someone has to do this now. I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to have you guys do this. Okay? But anyway, but it can be done. <laughs> Good. So, so, when, so if you've had this with something here, then you understand that we're going to combine a rationalist and empirical approach to come to the conclusion that actually faith, and I would argue specifically the Islamic faith, is in line with reason. But we have to take this with a pinch of salt, because both methodologies do still have assumptions that they cannot justify. They have to start somewhere. For example, the empiricist, he starts with the assumption that the external world exists. The external world is real. You can't really prove that. You can't really 100% prove it. Because how do you know your brain is not in a vat? And it's in Mars, and someone's got like probes in your brain making you feel the things that you feel. You would never know. How would you know? So you do start with some assumptions. So when we say, you know, reason of faith, proof, evidence, we basically mean, or I basically mean, good reasons to believe. This is what we mean. We have good reasons to believe. Because if you think about it from an Islamic theological position, we have this concept called fitra, okay? And this concept is basically, can be described as innate dispositions. We believe that we've been created with innate dispositions that can acknowledge basic morality and the oneness of God, for instance. And this is almost like an inherent assumption that we don't need to prove because it just is. And we use that to build the world. So there is a way of transcending rationalism and empiricism by just discussing a theological concept of the fitra, but that's in the Q&A because you might lose everybody if you discuss it now. So, how can we show now, by using a rationalist and empirical position, combining them together, which I've called reason, how can we use this to show that faith and reason are actually friends and not enemies. How can we show this? Well, the way to show this is by showing, using re reason, that the foundations 
of a particular tradition are, are just defined. For instance, from a design perspective, these foundations are God, the Quran, and somehow other people would argue prophethood. So if this is the intellectual foundations of a particular tradition with regards to the Islamic faith, the Islamic tradition, how can we use a rationalist and empirical approach, a reason, a reasonable approach, using our reason to actually justify that we have good reason to believe in God, the Quran, which is the book of the Muslims, and prophethood itself. Now, with regards to God, there's around 20 arguments for the existence of God. Argument from design, argument from morality, ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, many different types of arguments, okay? Now, one argument I like to use is the argument I call God makes sense of the beginning of the universe. Because if you think about it, brothers, sisters, and friends, we have all asked the same questions. Why does something exist? Rather than nothing. The famous rationalist, the German polymath Leibniz, he said in his essay, the first question that must be asked and answered is why does something exist rather than nothing? This is why the Quran, also the book of the Muslims, actually says in one of the verses, do you think the universe came out of nowhere? Do you think the universe came out of nothing? <clears throat> so, to answer this question, we could either posit a cause for the universe, or say that the universe is uncaused. Now, let's discuss, is it rational to say that the universe is uncaused? For example, the famous atheist Bertrand Russell said in a radio program, the universe is a brute fact. It just exists. It has no beginning, and it has no end. If we take this into consideration, that would imply that the universe has an infinite history. It has an infinite history of past events. But we know this can't be true because the infinite, as a concept, doesn't exist in the real world, in the material world. It leads to paradoxes and absurdities. And let me give you an example. Say I have an infinite amount of pens in this room. If I take 20 pens away, how many pens do I have left? Infinite or infinite minus 20. Practically, and whatever the case may be, we should now be able to count how many pens we have in this room, but we can't. Although this is coherent in a mathematical realm of discourse because it has its own axioms and conventions. But when you export the concept into the real world, it leads to paradoxes. Let me give you another example. Say we have a hundred bottles in this room, <laughs> just about as many on this table, okay? And if I say, at every possible moment, I add another bottle. Bottle 101, bottle 102, bottle a million and one, and it continues. Will I ever reach amount of bottles that we could describe as infinite? No, because we could always have plus one. So the infinite here is potential, never actualized in the real world. This is why the infinite would make no sense in the real world called the universe. So it would mean that the universe must be finite <coughs> and cannot be infinite. And if it's finite, therefore it means it began to exist. And if it began to exist, it necessitates it has a cause. This is why mathematicians like Kazman and Newman would say the infinite is essentially nowhere to be found in the real world. It doesn't make sense to say that there are infinite number of fish in the sea. The German mathematician David Huber, he said exactly the same thing. He said the infinite doesn't have a basis in reality. It doesn't provide a legitimate basis of rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. So we've got good evidence to show, rational, philosophical evidence to show, that the universe began to exist, therefore it must have a cause. Even if we go to the empirical position, we also have astrophysical evidence. Who's heard of the Big Bang? 
Good. And it's all that thing that happens after too many curries, okay? <laughs> now the Big Bang, also called the hot standard model, and there's many other models, but all the models thus far, according to physicists, they still have principles that necessitate a beginning. So let's talk about the hot standard model. The hot standard model basically states that there was a point which cosmologists called singularity, where apparently the universe came into being, time came into being, space came into being, all matter and energy were created at that cosmic event. Even if you read the works of Vilenkin, the famous physicist, I think in 2003, he actually said that we can't run away from the idea that the universe began. We can't run away from that idea. So it would mean that a proponent of this astrophysical cosmological theory that the universe began to exist. So if it began to exist, it must have a cause because, listen to the logic. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. And this in philosophy is a logic is a logically sound and valid argument. But all we've proven here is a cause. We haven't proven it's Allah. We haven't proven it's God. We haven't proven it's Jesus. We have given no good reasons for that. All we've shown is that there's a cause. This is why I would argue that humanity has disagreed over God since 6000 BC Sumeria. We've had approximately 3,800 different terms of God, ranging from Chinese gods to Australian gods to, I don't know, Canadian gods. <laughs> Maybe we've differed with two many different descriptions and names. God knows, all right? So, so the only way I think to find out if it's in line with a monotheistic view of God is actually to use something called conceptual analysis. All that means is, let's think about this cause. So, if this cause created time and space, then it necessitates that this cause must be one. Because if we follow the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, Occam's razor, which says do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then we would argue that the best explanation is the most simplest, which means it's one. Also, we could argue that this cause must be uncaused. Because if we say, well, what caused the cause that caused the universe? Then what stops us from saying, what caused that cause that caused that cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? <laughs> now, what stops us from saying, what caused that cause that 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 caused the universe? If we do this ad infinitum forever, will we ever have the universe? No. This is why one of the most ridiculous arguments that I think some atheists propose, which is, well, who created God? Or who caused the cause? That very question itself denies our existence. So it must be uncaused. Also, I would argue, must be immaterial and transcendent. Because if it created time and space, it must transcend time and space. And time and space indicates that it has a, it, the material world exists within time and space. And outside of that, we suspend judgment. We, have better reasons to believe that it is immaterial. Significantly, this cause must have a will. Because if it has a will, it means it can choose. If it could choose, it can, it can have a personal relationship with personal agents in the universe. So how do we know this cause has a will? Because we could argue it chose. Because if it's eternal and brought into existence a finite effect like the universe, then it must have chosen the universe to come into existence. And choice indicates a will, and a will indicates it can interact with personal agents in the universe. So just by using reason, some empiricism, conceptual analysis, we come to the conclusion what Islam concluded 1400 years ago, as the Quran, the book of the Muslims, said in the 112th chapter, say, talking to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which means peace and blessing be upon him, say, God is one. The absolute, the eternal. He begets not, nor was he begotten, and there is nothing like unto him. One eternal, immaterial. So just by using our reason, we have good reasons to believe that God exists. So 
for the sake of q and A, I'll just go, there you go. Okay? So we've established one intellectual pillar of the monotheistic creed with regards to the Jewish, the Christian, and Islamic traditions. There may be other traditions that believe in it. Like. This is the separation factor. This is the differentiation. This is the differentiator, if you like. As even the Quran says, the al furqan the differentiator. Because the Quran describes itself as the differentiator. Because if you think about it, scripture differentiates itself from other traditions. That's what defines a particular tradition as itself. For example, how do we know about Christianity? We go to the Bible. How do we know about biblical Christianity? We go to the Bible. How do we know about Buddhism? We go to the scriptures. How do we know about the, the Jewish tradition? We go to the Torah. How do we know about the, how do we know about the Hindu tradition? We go to the various books that they have, etc., etc. So, how can we argue using the empiricism, rationalism, reason, that the Quran is not from the natural world? We've got good reason to believe it's a signpost to the transcendent. There's many arguments. But first and foremost, let's discuss what the Quran actually is as a book. Now, I would humbly argue that the Quran is a very interesting book. It's an imposing book. Yeah? It wants to impose itself on all of humanity. But this imposition is very positive. Because it wants to intrude into the inner dimensions of the human being. And the way it intrudes into the inner dimension of the human being is by asking profound questions. Do they not reflect within themselves? The Quran can be described as a very existential book, meaning it talks about the reality of the human being. What does it mean to exist? See, the Quran doesn't accept a socialization thesis. The Quran does not accept a socialization thesis. It doesn't say you should be and are just a product of society. No. Because the Quran fundamentally says, who are you as a human being? This is why Aristotle, he said self-knowledge is foundational. If you don't know who you are, you don't know how to interact with the wider universe. You don't even know who other people are, etc, etc. So it's very fundamental this point about what does it mean to be me? A very profound question, brothers and sisters and friends. What does it mean to be me? So the Quran actually says, are you just a product of society? Are you just a product of biology? Are you just a product of circumstance? Are you just a product of political situation? Are you a product of Canada? If you are just these things, then it doesn't make you any different from a robot, let's type in the social biological code and we act in accordance with that. That's not a very healthy way of looking at the human being. A healthy way of looking at the human being is what the Quran says. Eloquently, are you just going to follow your forefathers, your society, the socialization effects of society, peer pressure, political pressure, biology, are you just a product of that? The Quran says, no, think about your reality and what it means to be you. This is why the existential philosophers, they used to have this concept called thrownness. That you're thrown into reality and you just have to accept reality and then create a new being for yourself and try to deal with reality. Similarly with the Quran, it's very existential that way. So, it's a book that makes you think, definitely. If what I'm saying is correct, then it definitely makes you think. This is why the Quran says, And thus, we've explained our signs, our evidence, in detail for those who reflect. Actually means, not just to think like a desert romantic, touching uh, the sand and looking at the stars, maybe having a puff of the magic dragon or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, not to be like that. Rather, when you're reflecting upon something, you must inquire about the implications of what you're reflecting upon. What does it mean as a beginning to the universe? What does it mean to be me? This is what Yatafakkarun means for those who, to, who reflect, for those who have deep thoughts. This is what we need to do. But the Quran, brothers and sisters, goes much further than this because the Quran actually challenges people if they are doubting the authorship of the Quran. 
As the Quran says in the second chapter, the 23rd verse, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِمِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ The English translation, and if you are in doubt about this book, which we have sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then bring one chapter like it, and call on your witnesses, and your supporters, and your helpers, and your scientists, and your scholars, and your teachers, and your physicists, and your linguists, Besides God, if you are truthful in your claim, one of the only religious books that actually has a falsification test. Your beliefs from the divine, challenge it. And the Islamic scholars, including non-Islamic scholars by the way, they have said that this challenge is to do with literary aspects, natural phenomena, such as scientific stuff. Yeah, let's put it there. And you have other things like numerical consonants. Numerical consonants, with the coherence from a numerical perspective. Now, let's start with the easiest one, numerical consonants. So look, we have to understand that the Quran was revealed over a 23 year period, and many of its verses were revealed instantaneously for specific issues along the historical period of 23 years. There were issues, Quran came down as revealed verses to deal with particular problems. There's approximately 6,000 plus verses in the Quran. Now, the Quran has amazing numerical consonants, numerical coherence, that can't really be justified with a natural explanation. Because there were no computers at the time, and how can you develop numerical coherence with 6,000 verses plus? And those verses were revealed instantaneously for specific periods. The only assumption could be that someone knew the future. Because for instance, man and woman is mentioned exactly the same times in the Quran. For instance, we have world and afterlife, dunya and akhira, mentioned exactly the same amount of times. We have the biggest chapter in the Quran, which is the second chapter, has 286 verses. It was revealed over a nine year period. And if you cut that chapter in the middle to the 143rd verse, you would find the word middle. <laughs> now these are some exciting things that we can find about the Quran itself. And there's many, many more. But these are some examples that I want to show that how can it be possible since the Quran was just an oral tradition, not preserved in a computer or in a database, revealed instantaneously over a 23 year period, for specific circumstances you have this amazing numerical consonance. Doesn't really make sense. Let's talk about natural phenomena. Now, to be honest, I'm not entirely convinced with the second one, but I'm going to give it anyway. Because it's useful. It provides an accumulative case. Now, the Qur'an has about 1,000 verses that directly speaks about man, life, and the cosmos. Man, life, and the entire universe. It talks about natural phenomena. And there are some things that surely could not have been known 1,400 years ago. Almost impossible. For instance, the Qur'an mentions something about mountains. And it says mountains have like almost peg-like, root-like structures underneath the original mountain. Okay, and they're about 10 to 15 times the height of the mountain itself. And they have a function which is to prevent the earth from moving underneath it. Now, this was unknown 1400 years ago. The type of science at that time was so primitive that the only function of the mountain was to keep the sky up. Yeah, that, that was the kind of primitive knowledge of science at the time. It's just to keep the sky up. So the problem here is how can an illiterate Arab, for example the famous Romantist Richard Bell, he said in his works that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was illiterate. He came from an illiterate people. Those people were described as the lizard-eating people. They were irrelevant. The Romans and Persians didn't even really want to deal with them, to be honest. They were like the ashtray of the world. Because it was way too hot. Yeah? So how could the Prophet know this when the Quran mentions that we have 
mountains that have peg or stake like structures and it's to prevent from the earth moving underneath it. And this concept is called isostasy in geology, which only been found in the later part of the 20th century. And isostasy is a posh word for like an Archimedes fulcrum point. Now many people think, oh the Quran is talking about the formation of mountains. We know how mountains are formed, through tectonic plates, etc. But this is about the structure and function which is different from formation. So how can the Prophet Muhammad know this 1400 years ago? Also we have a literary argument. The Quran is a unique linguistic genre. It's a unique literary form. It de-scoped the Arabic language. In the Arabic language, brothers and sisters, with regards to structural features, we have prose, poetry, Poetry is split into 16 rhythmical patterns called the Al, Bihar. Yeah, there's rhythmical patterns. And they're based upon syllable rhythm. For instance, we have the, one of the rhythmical patterns is at Tawil. And the pattern goes Ba, 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 Ba. So that's the pattern. And prose, we have normal speech. And we have rhyme prose. And a distinctive feature of rhyme prose is accent-based pattern. An accent-based pattern, as an example, is a nursery rhyme. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Okay? No, based on the syllable, based upon the accent. Do you sing this in school? <laughs> yeah? Oh, it's good. I thought it was. Being really weird, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, good. So the Quran actually is its own distinct literary form, which is different from things like Shakespeare and Homer. Shakespeare would produce his works many times in the iambic pentameter, which could be replicated by people. But the Quran brought a new form of language. This was problematic. This is why A.J. Aubrey, the famous orientalist and translator of the Quran, he said the Quran is neither prose nor poetry. Bruce Lawrence, Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University, he said, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, labeled in meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. So the point is, how do you explain this? Well, you may say, well, I don't know anything about Arabic language. Why do I believe you that there's prose and poetry? Maybe you're lying. Maybe you're a charlatan. Maybe you're just an idiot. <laughs> Maybe, yes. There's a possibility, yeah. But the point is, I'm going to show you something that you wouldn't even require you to know even one word of the Arabic language. And what I'm going to use is something called logical deduction. And logical deduction <coughs> is a thinking process where we, we start with a universally accepted statement and from that draw logical conclusions. Let me give you an example. Put your hand up if you believe Greece, where I'm from, originally parents, Greece exists. Okay, good. We have a democratic vote <laughs> of everyone agreeing that Greece exists. Good. <coughs> Who's been to Greece before? Put your hand up. One person. One person. Two people, sorry. Let's ignore them for now. <laughs> The majority of us believe in the existence of Greece, but we've never been there before. So how do you know Greece exists? Oh, you've spoken to a Greek guy. Yes, <laughs> Tiganis, Yeah? But doesn't mean Greece exists though. If I came to you and I said, I'm a Fufolian from the planet Fufula. <laughs> Does that mean there's a place such as Fufula? Does that mean that? No, it's a claim. Have you ever eaten Greek food before? In Greece? So I want to ask you a question. How do you know Greece exists? Well, you may even say, well, there's this map, right? And here's Canada, here's America, here's Britain, there's Greece, yeah? <laughs> like that big thing called Greece, right? Um, it's on the map and it says Greece. Well, if I drew your map and I said, you know, 
There's a big item we missed out. And it's called, I don't know, Lombardo or something. I don't know. Call it anything here. Yeah. Does that mean it actually is true? See, your conviction. You're convinced that Greece exists not because of a particular reality or of an experience. You believe that Greece exists in reality based upon a philosophical phenomenon called, you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's a philosophical phenomenon called testament. If you read, for example, the philosopher C.A. Cody in his book talking about the philosophy of testimony, we believe in most of the things that we believe in based upon recurrent reporting. It's been reported by so many different people at different times and different places that to say that it's wrong is tantamount to saying your mother is not your mother, really. And it's an epistemological argument. It's an argument of, of the study of belief, the study of knowledge. And it's testimony. Testimony tells us that Greece is actually a, a country that exists and to claim that it's not is irrational. So why, where am I going with this? Well, where I'm going with this is I'm going to show you that to reject the Quran, to reject the divine authority of the Quran is equivalent of rejecting that Greece exists. How do you like that one? So what's the universally accepted statement with regards to the Quran? Well, according to Eastern and Western scholarship, the universally accepted statement is that no one has been able to successfully challenge the Quran. It's an assumption. We can justify it. But let's work with it. So we have certain possible explanations. Could it be from an Arab? Well, we say it can't be from an Arab because at the time of Revelation 1400 years ago, the Arabs were described as Arabic linguists par excellence. They were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. Even the famous Arab linguist, the best Arab linguist, Walid ibn al muhira he said, by God, this cannot come from a human being. And we have many preserved challenges to our history that we've seen fall into the category of prose and poetry and have not developed a unique structural form like the Quran has. So let's go to the next level. Can it be from a non-Arab? Well, this is obvious. You need to speak Arabic and not Arabic to challenge the Quran. Fine. What about, let's go back a step, someone may argue and say, what about today's Arab? Today's Arab, not the past, may be able to do it. Well, I think that's impossible because today's Arab has suffered something called linguistic degeneration. It's a linguistic phenomenon that our language has degenerated from the pure form. I'll give you an example. How do you say telephone in Arabic? Anyone know? Telephone. <laughs> They've only elongated the moon bit just to make it out, just to Arabize. <laughs> just to Arabize what, how to say telephone, right? So it's been linguistic degeneration. So that claim is not very strong. So who's next? Some may claim the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the next option. And some are to say he was just a unique genius. But there's a problem here. And the problem is, he has to, and logically speaking, if one Arab could do it, we have the same tools, the same blueprint, we should be able to do it too. Also, we know from a psycholinguistic perspective, the Quran is in a divine voice. It doesn't fluctuate in the type of psychological impact it has. It's in a divine voice. But we know every author has some of his character inserted in the text. This is why when we study psycholinguistics, we have something called grounded theory, discourse analysis, etc. that enables us to understand, you know, what is the emotionality, intentionality, psychology of the author. But the Quran is in the divine text. And this is almost impossible, I would argue, since the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he experienced a 23-year prophetic history of challenge, of boycott, of torture, of his companions dying, his children dying, his wife dying, boycotted from his beloved city, stoned by children, blood running down his legs. But these emotions are not reflected in the Quranic discourse. I would argue this is almost a psycholinguistic psycho impossibility. Also, we have 
the prophetic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad are distinct in style from the Quran itself. How can someone maintain this for 23 years continuously? Also, we know that every human expression can be emulated. Who studies art here? You uncultured lot. <laughs> okay, art for instance, okay? Now in art, we have things like Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, whatever the case may be. The first artist who developed this new form of art was like, wow, it's amazing. But since we have the blueprint of the original art form, we can emulate it, we can copy it. We have the tools and techniques, we have the brush strokes, we have the texture, we have the paints. We have the art itself. But we have the blueprint of the Quran, which is today, we have it today. We have the words and letters of the Arabic language and the finer grammatical rules, but we can't exhaust them to produce the Quran. Impossible. Because human expression can be emulated. This is why there's even a difference of opinion with regards to Shakespeare. They say some of his works are attributed to Christopher Marlowe, for instance. Some even say that Shakespeare wasn't one man, he was a couple of guys. So, who's next? Because we've got good reason to believe it can't be from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Who's next? Now, from a Christian perspective, and I've had this discussion with Christian theologians uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London University, they would say it's from the devil, right? That's the other option. We agree it can't be from an Arab. We agree it can't be from a non-Arab. We agree it can't be from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But don't jump to God because it could be from Satan. And then I said to this particular gentleman, well, how do you know Satan exists? And his reply was, because your Quran says so. <laughs> also, you believe in Quran, do you? I said, give you another chance. He said, well, the Bible says so, the Torah says so. But the problem is, it's an unseen reality. And the only way to justify it is by scripture. And I'm not going to take it for face value. You would have to prove to me why that scripture is true. So the onus of proof is on them. So from a logical deduction perspective, we've got good reasons to believe that the Quran itself has come from the divine. Based upon this logical deduction. So again, we can have our tick. There you go. The second intellectual pillar of Islam. Now the third and final one is an interesting one. It's actually not necessary in my opinion because the Prophet himself was the carrier of the Qur'an and he's mentioned in the Qur'an and it just logically follows that he would be a prophet if he carried a divine message but we could do an external analysis of his life to find out how he really was the prophet now there are certain arguments we could use and I'm adopting a C.S. Lewis he was a Christian literateur and he was a Christian philosopher I think he was overrated I think the Russian Dostoevsky he was also a Christian apologist he was a far better writer don't get me wrong, C.S. Lewis was a great, great, great writer. But I think Dostoevsky is much better. And many other Christian theologians actually agree with that. They say Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, was quite powerful, especially when we talk about morality and stuff like that. Anyway, so the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, could have been a liar, deluded, both, or truthful. So first and foremost, it's irrational to call him a liar. Because even his enemies would trust him. His enemies called him the trustworthy. His enemies used to give him money to hold. They wouldn't even trust their own people. The Prophet Muhammad was not known to be a liar at all, to the fact that he would bring tribes together. Was he deluded? Was he just a madman? Well, this is quite a crazy argument. It's a deluded argument to claim he was deluded. Because the Qur'an, for instance, has a beautiful argument against this and says, your companion is not deluded nor straight. The word here is companion, meaning intimate friend. You've known this guy for 40 years. If you knew he was mad, you would have known before. There was no signs indicating this. Also, we know he's not deluded because the things he taught are not the result of a deluded man. Feed the neighbor. You're not a true believer if you leave your neighbor hungry. Or if you, if you disturb your neighbor, whether the Muslim or non-Muslim. You're not a true believer unless you love for others or you love for yourself. Also, not even that, because these may be, things may be termed as common sense. But what about economic theory? The Prophet Muhammad, P. 
peace and investment being put in, developed a whole economic model, which we could discuss in the Q&A. This is why the Prime Minister of Ireland, he said if we had the Islamic economic system, we would not be in the problem we have today. This is based on stability. We don't have this fractional reserve type of banking. We don't have free floating money. It's pegged on gold and silver. We don't have interest, which is an impediment to the distribution of wealth. We have a unique geopolitical model, which means limit, there are essential limited needs and enough resources. If you compare that to liberal capitalist model, too many needs, not enough resources, creates competition. The other view creates distribution. We could discuss this in the Q&A. So how can this be the product of a deluded man? And if he was deluded, for instance, he would use specific instances in his favor, he never did that. For example, his son passed away, and then there was an eclipse. And everyone thought, oh my God, God made the eclipse because your son passed away. What did he say? He said, no, I'm just a man. He didn't use that in his favor. So we have no reason historically to believe to do this. Can he be both? This is a logical possibility. Can you have a triangle with four sides? No, because a liar is someone who knows his lying, but yet keeps on lying. And a deluded person thinks he's speaking the truth, but he's baseless. Another view, just to add that he couldn't be a liar, because look what he sacrificed. He was on the battlefield protecting the Muslims and people with swords, sacrificing your life. He didn't gain no money. He was offered women, riches and power and rejected it just for the expression of the monotheistic creed. Is this the psychological profile of a liar? To claim such a thing is the equivalent of claiming your mother is not your mother. So we've got good reasons to believe he's truthful. So we have another tip. So brothers, sisters and friends, from our discussion of rationalism, empiricism, using reason, we have shown interesting reasons, good reasons to believe in the existence of God, the inimitability and miraculous nature of the Qur'an, and the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, all of which provide a justification for the Islamic worldview. I want us truly, in the Q&A, to have a frank discussion. As we said in the beginning, we turn our internal radios off, we want to connect with each other as human beings. So I want us to follow a very nice value, and it's an Islamic value as well. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, the cure to ignorance is to ask and learn. And in this light we should proceed, and it's important we do so. And I also ask you, if you have questions that are not directly related, don't be shy. If you have problems with Sharia law, or if you have problems with cutting the hand of the thief, or you have all these kind of outdated cliches that exist in the paradigm of Fox News, <laughs> and manifest themselves from the lips of Bill O'Reilly. No, to be honest, we all fall for that narrative. Do you know why? Because that's all we have. That's all we have. We have a dangerous media, and we have we have Muslims who don't speak about the tradition. And we should do this as human beings, to connect with other human beings. Anyway, I think it's been a 10 minute break. Those who haven't prayed Maghrib should pray Maghrib. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. See you in 10 minutes, guys.